Well, good evening everybody. I must apologize for getting late, but I won't blame it on the traffic because we are supposed to be doing roads and things like that here but as engineers, but can't help it. Okay. <coughs> I understand, I mean, that normally these, like, this particular, these B paper lectures are fairly full up, but due to the holidays, I'm sure a lot of people have taken leave and are enjoying themselves still. So, anyhow, those of you are in it now, they can always watch it on, on the on the web later on even, so that's fine. Yeah, you all are sitting this P paper for the first time or are any of you repeats? All first time, right? repeating? Yes. First time, all. So that's good, everybody's first time. Otherwise, you might be both stiff listening to the same old thing coming up for the second time or third time or. Have you all read through the ISL code of ethics? Do you know what the code of ethics in the, it's now on the web, it's in the uh, PR, in a PR rules in the bylaws revision book. Uh, have you gone through the code of ethics? No one has gone through the code of ethics. That's not good because you are going to get a couple of questions on that and if you don't go to the code of ethics, at least you know what it is, other you won't understand what I am talking. It might be like double dutch or whatever it is. Anyhow, having said that, let's hope that everything works out well, you, I, that I can give you a reasonably good understanding of what the code of IESL code of ethics is about and as professionals, why we should why we should uh, abide by a code of ethics and a code of professional conduct because as you know the, the rural situation, the country situation, everything now, law, order, ethics are all more or less flying out of the window. But uh, we still try to hope that the young engineers coming out and going into uh, professional practice will be able to uh, have a good understanding of ethics, of ethical behavior and be able to practice as abide by the code of ethics and ensure that they only do and they do the right thing always. Basically my presentation will be broken into five sections. Ethics which is basically an explanation of what ethics is, is very short. Then engineering institutions, codes of ethics of other engineering institutions and then we come to the IESL code of ethics. Professional conduct and then disciplinary procedures. Now you may ask why are we talking about disciplinary procedures? Any idea why? Why are we having, why are we talking about disciplinary procedures with the code of ethics? Come on, talk. Okay, the code of ethics tells you what you should do and what you should not do. What you should do correctly and what, what you should not be, or what you should not do incorrectly, right? So, but if there is nothing to regulate it, it's meaningless. I mean, the law is there in a country to ensure that people act in a correct way and do the right thing. Right? And there is a disciplinary procedure to discipline the people who do the wrong thing. Just this morning I got copped for crossing lanes according to the policeman. I thought I didn't cross lanes but he, he said okay. But I mean, so, but that, and then I have got a dadakole now and I have to go and pay and, but that, that is a disciplinary procedure to ensure that I stick, do the right thing and in future I learn from that and don't do the wrong thing. And, that, and similarly the ISL also has a disciplinary procedure in, inbuilt into the system to ensure that if somebody does the wrong thing then you can not penalize him but hopefully correct him and guide him back onto the correct way of doing things. We are not so much here to penalize people and pack you off for six months rigorous imprisonment or anything like that, but we will 
try to help you to come back, show you where you've gone wrong, where you've done the wrong thing, and help you to come back on track. Because you are whole, you got a whole life ahead of you as a professional engineer, and you had to learn to do the right thing always. So the definition ethics is basically the discipline of dealing, and it deals with what is good and bad. Very simple. There are good things that you can do, and there are bad things that you should not do, and that is what ethics is about. The principle of conduct governing an individual or groups. Now we are moving into the groups of professionals, right? So the professionals have a have ethics governing their conduct. And a value structure that guides the actions of a person, whether individual or corporate, in her dealing with other people. All these mean the same thing, good or bad. Bottom line is that good or bad. Basically, you can consider ethics like a pyramid with, or with ethics as a professional practice as a pyramid with ethics as the as a base, and then you have professional body, the public and the government, you know, working together. Now, ethics is something that you all have learned right from your childhood. Right? When you are small, your parents always tell you what is right and what is wrong. You must be obedient. You must uh, eat your food regularly. You must not go and play in the mud. You know, your parents are always telling you the right, what what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And that, in a way, is the foundation for ethics. When you go to school, you get a better, a wider, a wider perspective because your teachers will tell you, okay, this is this is what you must do. You must do your work well. You must be obedient. You must not shout in class. You must not throw paper balls at other people and that that type of thing. And the difference is that. At home, parents may not discipline you that much, but in school you might get disciplined. Nowadays, uh, schools, school teachers are not allowed to discipline pupils who do the wrong thing. But my time when I was in school, it, the teachers never hesitated to give you a cane or to whack you with a ruler or whatever it is. And if it was a serious thing, you were sent to the headmaster where you got caned. It's a rattan cane. That was discipline, and that is for breach for a breach of conduct. And then you go also. Then you start going to Dhamapasala, to Sandra School, to whatever the religious bodies have to offer. And there you also taught taught the principles of good and bad. Because at the end of the day, you are expected to be a, a model in society, to be a good person, to do the right things, and not resort to Criminal activities, in a sense. So, any questions up to this point? This is very basic introduction of ethics. Uh, please feel free to ask. Right? You all are engineers, graduate, or ESL qualified, or whatever qualification you have. You all are engineers now. You are on the first step of your professional career, right? And. If as engineers you don't talk, you're going to be in big trouble later on. So, if you have any questions, just ask. Uh, I'd like this to be an interactive session, not to be a one-way street thing where I talk and talk and talk and they haven't even got a bottle of water. Quench my thirst, but that's okay. Uh, so that, so no questions. Okay. Now, why have a code of ethics? One is to define acceptable behavior. And that is again to say, do the right thing. Acceptable behavior is doing the right thing. Or what is what is required by society as as the based on the norms of a decent society. To promote high standards of practice. Now here we are moving into the profession. Right. As an engineer, you will abide by, by uh, say, various design standards, 
will be follow course of practice for manufacturing and if you abide by the code of ethics you are supposed to follow those not to take shortcuts in your design we, you will find that you require to have so much of reinforcement in a in a concrete beam you do that if your design if is justified you use that but because some contractor wants to make a little a fast buck you allow him to reduce now that is a violation of the code of ethics so you have to be conscious that you have to always have high standards of practice as a professional engineer right the same goes for doctors lawyers whatever it is they all have code of ethics try to benchmark for members who use it for self evaluation now if i want to just see am i doing the right thing uh, especially if you have confronted with a situation that you do two options two or three options of decision making then you can go back to the isl code of ethics and say what does it say for this situation can i should i do a, a follow option a or b or c and that that's what it means by gives you a benchmark a guideline for eval for you to evaluate and decide what's the right thing to do in a particular situation <coughs> establish a framework for professional behavior and responsibilities same thing i mean basically it sets out once you go to the the code of ethics you will see that there are definite guidelines for behavior and respond levels of responsibility that you will need to take in your professional practice as a vehicle of occupational identity this has nothing to do with vehicles tax tax free or otherwise but it basically it means that it is it's a way of establish yourself as an engineer now as a engineer as a professional body the isl has a code of ethics and that is looked at as a fact that the isl is a progressive body it has a set of guidelines for its members and it's the same thing here a mark of occupational maturity which means that the isl is a, a serious mature professional body okay anything on this any questions okay i will proceed now i will just take a few examples of codes of ethics or conduct of some of the leading professional bodies every engineering uh, association in all pretty every country in the world now has its own code of ethics but you will find that there is lot of similarity at least 70 to 80 percent overlap it's the same thing put in different ways maybe the language is different whatever it is but by and large it deals with common aims and ideals of an engineer now fiani is really the uh, european it's a uh, it's a governing body for all european so engineering associations right and uh, it basically with this i i make i see the the french one the german one whatever the institution is they generally are, the foundation is as developed by fiani and according to fiani the main ethical principles are that that the decisions and actions of an engineer have a large impact on the environment and on society so actually all the work you do has an impact or the bulk of it has an impact on the environment and on society and therefore the engineering profession has an obligation to ensure that it works in the public interest and with regard to health safety and sustainability so basically the engineer works in the interest of the public the the masses and with special consideration for the health that you ensure that all your 
processes are safe, are uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, they are health. They, are, they do not affect the health or the of of, of the community. They don't affect the safety of the community, and they contribute to the environmental protection, which is what sustainability is. I'll quickly go through this. So, their code of ethics says that you see the public interest. The engineers have to act work in the public interest and exercise all skill, reasonable skill and care in carrying out their work. Right. Now, to do that, You shall maintain your relevant competence in the nece at the necessary level and only undertake tasks for which you are competent. What do you understand by that? You only do what you what you are competent to do. What do you think? What do you think, sir? As an engineer, you have certain competencies, you have certain special skills. If you are a structural engineer, you should only practice as a structural engineer. You can't go and do water supply schemes or do uh, uh, electrical wiring. Maybe you learnt all these in your first year or second or third year in the campus, but you have, at the end of the day, you have graduated as a civil engineer and you are now specialising structural or you may be in the, in the water boarding, water supply and this in distribution or transmission or pumping station or whatever it is. You have a particular competence, a speciality. So, you have to work in that area, you are not supposed to work outside that area. And, and because if wherever you work, you have to take responsibility. You can't shirk that responsibility. As you know now, those anybody could have signed any design for building, for foundations, for anything. Now, the I think the, uh, the local authorities insist that only people with a particular competence in structural engineering can sign, I think all, up to four stories or something, anyone can sign beyond up to eight or thing beyond that, there are people with a certain level of competence who can sign and high rise still further. So you can only sign for things that you are competent to do. Similarly, the CEB registered registers electrical engineers to certify uh, the, the the wiring and the the design and wiring and uh, installation of house household and factory or any any wiring uh, electrical distribution system in an organized in a house or business premises and only people who are registered by the CEB can do that because only after you have the certificate signed by the CEB engineer will the CEB give you your power connection. Those days, they said any chartered engineer could sign, so they didn't care whether you are civil, electrical, or mechanical, everybody signed everything, which was wrong. So, basically, you shall only do work in your level, at your level of competence. You shall not misrepresent your educational qualification or professional titles. So, if you are a BSc engineer and uh, the job says, BS engineer with postgraduate college, you don't say you have a postgraduate qualification because you don't have it. When you write your CV, you say that you, you just put what you have. You don't have it, don't apply for that job. The chances are you won't get it. Because if you put that and you are found to be to a fraud, you made a fraudulent declaration, that can become a serious issue. Shall provide impartial analysis. I am going through this in, fair, in a bit of detail because the same thing is there in all the others. Shall provide impartial analysis and judgment to employee, employer or client. Avoid conflicts of interest. So basically, as the say, if you are in charge of a project, you have to be impartial. True, you are representing the your, the owner of your organization, the client, but if the contractor, for example, has a justified reason for a particular delay or a claim, then you must be fair by him. You can't say, no, you are the contractor, I, I have to look after my boss's interest, right or wrong. So, you have to be fair and impartial and generally, 
nowadays a lot of the contracts are covered by smaller by ICTAR or by FIDIC uh, conditions of contract, you have to follow those. And those provide for an impartial judgment in And you shall also avoid conflicts of conflicts of interest. You know what a conflict of interest is? Anybody likes to have a guess at that? Now, if you are the if you are the uh, engineer representing the your organization, and the contractor, the particular job requires a design and cons or construct of a of a bridge or roadway or whatever it is. The contractor can come and ask you, now you cannot do that because you have to at the end of the day certify his <coughs> design. He has to go to some other design engineer and get the work done. But he can, he knows that if you do it, you will pass it, you will pass your own drawing, which is wrong, your own design. So you, that is a conflict of interest. And you have to avoid things like that. Shall carry out the task of provide, prevent avoidable danger to health and safety and prevent avoidable adverse impacts on the environment. That is obviously do things safely and you try to minimize any or, or avoid any uh, environmental uh, degradation that can come from your project like discharging uh, process waste into the rivers or the waterways or emissions or dumping uh, toxic chemicals in some you know, dump in some landfill. So you have to avoid that type of thing and do things correctly to avoid any harm to the society and the environment. Then shall accept appropriate responsibility for their work. Obviously if you are doing the job you have to be responsible. Right? But people they are putting it here because people try to dodge that. You know typical you Sri Lankan also if, if it goes right, you will take all the credit. But if something was to go wrong, you will say, no, I didn't do it. I gave it to him, he did it. Or you will find somebody else and blame someone else. This is our, our culture. Not our culture, it's universal. So, but I think more so in Sri Lanka. Uh, you have to take responsibility for whatever work you do. Respect the personal rights of people with whom they work and the legal and cultural values of society where they carry out the assignments. I think that is a, also a relevant clause in Sri Lanka where we are a multiracial, multi religious, multi ethnic, everything possible, multiple in Sri Lanka. Right? It's not like most practically every country has this issue, but basically we have major differences in religion and communities <coughs> and ethnicities, and you have to respect that. You can't say, I'm superior to. To A and A, B, if we did to C and things like that. You have to respect people's rights. And shall be prepared to contribute to public debate on matters of technical understanding. If either they are technically competent to, con to comment on. So you have to now, like say, we have had issues like Norochale and uh, what was this uh, recent. Uh, dam uh, irrigation and dam project up in the in Badu, in Badula region now, wherever there are issues that where the public are you must as an engineer you should be able to contribute uh, your your uh, your valid and knowledgeable opinion on on what on whether the right thing will be done or not or the port city you know there has been a lot of debate but nothing is resolved it's just going up and down so as an engineer but only unless you're competent to talk about it. So, so basically that covers the Fiani Code of Conduct. Now the IC Code of Conduct, right, that's the Institute of Civil Engineers UK, again the same thing. You see, all members shall discharge their duties with integrity and behave with integrity, you see, all conduct, etc. Undertake work only that you are competent to do. So all members have full regard for the public interest in, re in relation to matters of health, safety and well-being of future generations, that means en environment sustainability. So it's the same thing repeated, all the engineering institutions 
in members have so due regard that you are a special one for the environment, shall develop your professional skills and knowledge and competence on a continuing basis and you uh, reasonable assistance for the and encourage yourself juniors also to develop their technical competence and skills. Ah, now this is a new one. So you are, in case you are convicted of a criminal offence, not a traffic offence or something, eh, but if a criminal offence for fraud or murder for example or something like that, you are supposed to inform the institution. If you go bankrupt, you are supposed to inform the institution, right? And th those things are not that, okay, Sri Lanka may, may or may not apply, but notify the institution any significant breach of rules of professional conduct by another member. So if somebody, you are one of your, someone you know, does the wrong thing, then it is your duty to uh, inform the IC. That also comes, I will come, we'll come back to that later. IE Code of Ethics, the same thing is there. I think if you can go into the web and read it, it will be good because otherwise we will waste a lot of time. But it is it's basically the same issues that are raised in the first two. Medical Society of Civil Engineers, same story. <coughs> because basically, you have to look after the health, safety and welfare of the public. Only services in areas that are competent. You shall issue statements in a subjective and manner, <coughs> and truthful manner. And you know, it's the same thing that occurs in the other two. So if we take these, the ISL Code of Ethics, Now, the ISO Code of Ethics, the first clause says, engineers shall hold paramount, the safe paramount, the safety, health and welfare of the public and proper utilization in the performance of their professional duties. <coughs> it shall take over their precedence over responsibility to the profession, the section of private interest, employees and others. Now, this same clause, clause occurs in all four of the codes of ethics of FIANI, IC, Society, American Society of Civil Engineers and IEEE. Engineers shall always act in a manner to uphold and enhance the honor, integrity and dignity of the profession of the profession by safeguarding public interest of all times. Again, <coughs> this is there in the IC and the AC, AC code. Engineers shall build a reputation on merit and not compete unfairly. That's found in the American Society of Civil Engineers. <coughs> Others, others don't think, seem to think that their people do any undercutting or things like that, but I think that happens. <coughs> then you shall only work in area that you are competent, that is there in all codes. Apply your skills and knowledge in the interest of your employer or client and act as faithful agents or trustees. So that there is no conflict of interest, that is then FIANI and Medical Society of Civil Engineers. Due evidence in a truthful manner, that is again then FIANI and the IEEE. Continuing professional development, that is there in everything. Because that is one of the most important things that you should abide by and follow as an engineer, practicing, as a young practicing engineer. Right? Because we are constantly learning. And you need to always follow CPD in either your subject or in, or in the wider range of, uh, of the profession. In environmental concerns, yes, that is there in everything. So basically, all the engineering institutions really talk about the same matter the same rules and regulations or same clauses are there in the in how an engineer should conduct himself. Okay. Now before we come to the ISO Code of Ethics, is there anything you want to ask me? If you have followed this, I hope. Just ask because uh, don't wait till the paper comes and then you don't, don't figure out what's happening. 
Uh, if you have anything you want to clarify or find out on what has been, yes sir. Conflict of interest. Yeah, now conflict of interest is basically that if you were to, now let's say you are, you are the, where are you working? Who? Ah, LTL. Okay. Now LTL projects, if you are in the design team and you are designing a, a new, you all are not, not involved in transmission, I have a more generation. No? But say if you are going to do a, there is a project that involves uh, design the contractor in that in the particular scope is the contractor to implement the project but there may be certain area where he has to design something right now if the contract and the, the contractor design has to be approved by you as the client's representative the retail representative right now if he comes and asks you to do the design you should you can't do it because if you do it there is a conflict of interest because you will automatically approve your own design no? but he should go to another design engineer somewhere and get that design done and bring it to you for approval once you approve it he can go ahead and construct and implement it but he cannot come and ask the client's engineer to do the job and if you as the client's engineer undertake that you are a, you are you are a breach of the code of conduct or the code of ethics so you have to avoid that situation <coughs> as far as your projects are concerned. Now for another project somewhere totally unrelated to your client and your organization, if somebody comes and asks you to do the design, you can do it. But you should not get involved in doing a design that is a part of, really a part of your job to supervise and ensure that it is correctly designed and implemented. Okay, does that clarify things or make it a little more clear? Okay, anything else? At least you ask some questions, you won't fall asleep. So, okay, let's get on to the ISL Code of Ethics. Clause <coughs> 1. So, the people shall hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public and the proper utilization of funds and other resources in the performance of their professional duties. So what it means is that you basically, your main concern is the, the health, safety and welfare of the public and the proper utilization of the funds that are allocated to you for doing that job. As uh, you know most most uh, engineers get involved in, in, in either a project either as a consultant or as a contractor or as a client or whatever. and you have to ensure that the funds allocated for that project are used correctly. Uh, not spent indiscriminately by way of careless, you know, bad uh, financial management or by way of doling out money for bribes and things like that. But you have to ensure that the money at every cent that is given to you for a job is used in the correct way for the benefit of the public. And that takes precedence over your responsibility to the profession, the sexual, your private interest or the employer, anyone else. So your first, your main aim in this ISA clause 1 is that you look after the interest of the people, the public. Right. Is that clear? You are a public servant, I mean we refer to government servants and engineers as public servants, but nobody really believes in what a, or what a public servant is. But you are there to serve the public. And this, there are a number of sub clauses which state that you shall be truthful in your professional reports and statements and you shall give correct information. You shall always endeavor to maintain essential services. Now, this thing, these two issues and has led to issues in the past where engineering organizations and the engineers in those organizations have felt that okay we are not getting our demand so we go strike people the country with cutting out the electricity services or the water supply or the 
solid waste management or any of these things. That is not correct. That is not acceptable as per the ISL code of ethics. We have had this happening with senior engineering organizations, but technically that is not an acceptable behavior of a professional engineer. Because the same applies to the doctors. At the top of head, the GMO goes on strike and, ups and really causes a lot of inconvenience to the poor people who have to go to the clinics for treatment. So, and at the end of the day, it's not the, the, the little more affluent can afford to go to a private clinic and get treatment. The, the, the poor who really can't afford and who have to rely on government services uh, are the people who suffer. Similarly, when say if the, if the electricity services are disrupted, everything collapses, including the hospitals. So, uh, the water supply, everything goes for sick. So you have to, you are not supposed to inconvenience public. You are supposed to work in the interest of the public. If you want to get your demands, you can go and negotiate that better with your bosses and your ministers and whatever it is. But you should not, at any, at all costs disrupt the lives of the, of the average man or the, or the public of the country. This is a bit of a controversial one because sometimes people feel no, we can only way to get our demands is to go on strike and upset the whole works. But that is not an uh, ethically correct way of behaving. <coughs> Shall work in conformity, recognize, I mean as engineers we have right from, right through from our University days, we have worked with standards. We have always followed British standards, ISO standards, Sri Lanka standards, whatever standards, your Euro standards, whatever it is. And you have to follow the standards. So that those standards are designed to ensure the health and safety of the community. So you are expected to abide by the standards. Then conflict of interest, I explained that short while ago, you should not be party to a situation that gives rise to a conflict of interest. You either work for your for your employer or, and the, and the, or the client or if you are not, you work for the other side. You can't be half-half. Conviction. Conviction doesn't mean that you are going to get convicted and packed off to jail. Conviction means what you think, what you believe in, right? If you, if your client or your employer wants you to do a particular job in a, <coughs> so you say build a factory in a particular area and you feel that that construction is going to be endanger the environment or, or upset the safety of the community living there, then you must tell him so and try to convince him that this is not the best option. Please look at another option, get a block of land somewhere else where you will not be causing any or in, in, include necessary safeguards in your design which will prevent any, any uh, harm to the community or the environment. Engineers, you are knowledgeable, you have to advise the, pub, the, the government and all the authorities, right? Unfortunately, engineers are not very, very rarely are the opinions of engineers sought in, in, in these projects. More often than not, it is some politician who will decide on what is going to do, be done. But engineers should advise because you know the best solution. You know the best tra uh, trace that the road should take. Politicians will want to change it because it affects somebody his some catcher's house or somebody's property, he wants it to be changed. But you have to say try to convince your em employer and the people concerned that this is the best trace, the most vi you know, viable trace from the point of view of sustainability, economic uh, economics and also practical implementation. You know what whistle blowing? Not blowing whistle, policemen are always blowing whistle. Do you know what whistle blowing is? <coughs> I think earlier in one of the one of the uh, 
I, I think the IC they said that it is the duty of the of the engineer to advise the institution if somebody does something wrong, one of the other members. Whistleblowing is that. Whistleblowing was is not a very nice thing. In school when you go, you are Kelangare, you are telling you are sneaking, you are you go and tell the teacher this fellow did this or you know go and complain about somebody. That that was not a very well accepted practice and most probably they were the person whom you complained about what and happened to you after school or whatever it is. But whistleblowing is basically now becoming accepted practice in pointing out, advising the authorities of something that has been done wrong by another professional. Right. So it's a new thing that's coming into you must be always honest, I mean let's face it. And always maintain a dialogue. Now the interesting thing is that the Institute of Chartered Accountants are now trying to incorporate whistleblowing into their ethical code as far as audit firms are concerned. Now audit firm, now when a firm does an audit, uh, accountancy firm does an audit of your books, they find a lot of irregularities. Some of those may be genuine mistakes, some may be fiddles. Yeah, people are trying to dodge paying taxes or trying to avoid you know various illicit transactions and now the, the CA instead of chart accountants have made that an official thing that that the person that the firm that's auditing must inform the authorities if there is some uh, irregularity in the that they come across so what from being a what was uh, something that people looked down and was not considered a, a nice thing, whistleblowing is now becoming an accepted part of professional practice. Okay, anything you want to ask on clause one? Any questions on clause one? Okay, let's go to clause 2. Ah, honor of the profession. Now, basically as engineers, we have a certain amount of regard and respect for our engineering profession. I hope so. Right? And what clause 2 tells you is that you must do everything to uphold the honor and dignity of the profession. Straightforward enough. I mean, you see, I mean, as much as, you know, whatever, if you are a member of a society or a club or even in school, you always, you like to, you, you want to hold the, uphold the honor of that organization because you have a sense of loyalty and concern about that place, right? So some of the sub clauses that help you to do that, that you must not be dishonest, right? Because if you are dishonest, and dishonesty here can be go up even to like bribery and you get caught it not only does it affect you it affects the whole community the whole in profession the so people say ah that see that engineer he took a bribe to to buy uh, you know to buy a batching plant or whatever it is where at an exorbitant price from some place and he could have got it from much cheaper from another country you know the talks are there and then finally if they goes to uh, the Bible Commission and you are found guilty, it's the whole, you are one person but the whole profession gets besmirched by your action. So you must always avoid fraud alert or dishonest things. You must not associate, use your association or your, your knowledge or your your relationship with with others like politicians and influential people to hide dishonest acts. And they said that if you an engineer has been removed from the ISL road for dishonesty or some lack of integrity, then you should not associate with him. Associate with him here in this sense that if you have a company of uh, you know to a Pereira and Fernando, chartered engineers or whatever it is, and that person, Fernando, is taken off the roll for some reason, then you cannot continue with the name of Pereira and Fernando. Then you have to re 
we were we we register yourself in the with un, under the company's ordinance and call yourself uh, Pereira and Sons or something like that and you know carry on, but you can't use this you, because Fernando has now been taken off the ISL role and he no longer a chartered engineer, he's no longer an uh, engineer, a professional engineer. Clause three. Any, anything you want? Clause two. Clause two is a short one. An engineer shall build their reputation on merit <coughs> and not compete unfairly. Basically, you, you rise up the, your professional ladder on your own merit, your own capabilities, right? Uh, which unfortunately we don't seem to observe very well because we can resort to bribery by giving our bosses and people who matter, politicians and people in, the, in charge of the ministry or somebody presents and you know various other gifts to get ourselves boosted up. You shall in, you shall uh, engage engineers on the basis of merit. Now when it comes to interviews you know quite often you will get a long list of people and the minister and the secretary and everybody will send another long list of people to be taken. Now some of those people may be good engineers, some of them may be absolute duds. They will all be BSc engineers, for example. But you have to select the people, for, if you are selecting them for your organization, on the basis of their competence and capability and the merit that they show as an engineer. Does that make sense? Undercutting is another famous Sri Lankan habit. We will go and, if we know somebody is going to get a promotion, we will go and sneak to the boss, say this fellow did this, he did that, he is in the wrong party, he supports the party, the part, this party A against party, and he is not a supporter of the ruling party, he is saying bad things about the, gov the government, and you go and sneak about the guy, and that poor fellow does not get the promotion or gets the job. So you must not, as a professional engineer, resort to undercutting. You have to get a, your job on your own merit, right? Then you must not misrepresent your qualifications. I spoke about that earlier. Your experience, your prior responsibilities. Now we, you know, like quite often when you are preparing your CV as you go up the ladder, you have to. They, especially for if you are going in for or on, on projects. They will ask a particular experience in particular areas and unless you have that area, some people will try to doctor the CV to show that you have that experience, which you, which you don't have. So you must be honest in your, in your, in your uh, pr in presentation of your qualifications and experience and not misrepresent the facts. Then mal malicious talk is another great Sri Lankan habit. Kalapattara and things are famous go around. Moment you you want to uh, like it's a part of undercutting in a sense. You want to get rid of somebody. You want to get that man's position. You start some story again saying that he's doing the wrong thing. He has you know he is getting gifts from the contractor. He's joining. He's a member of the wrong party. Whatever it is, right? And you spread this undercurrent of gossip and misinformation through the organization. And that poor person who is the victim of that uh, finally loses his job or whatever it is. Another great Sri Lankan habit using connections. You want a promotion? Uh, my uncle is the uh, deputy minister of this ministry, so I will go and talk to him and get the promotion. Whereas the better person who really should get it on merit doesn't get it because you have used your connections. So uh, the ISL, when they Prepare the code of ethics, look very closely at the Sri Lankan situation. Although this was done maybe 25 years ago, still they knew what Sri Lankans were and how Sri Lankan engineers or society function. So they use all these things as examples of what you should not do. Modesty, yeah. Now if somebody asks you to describe your what you are doing or 
you you don't say I did this, I did that, I built up all these things. I, you know, you must you can put it modestly. Say okay, I I assisted because generally engineering you work as a team. It's not a one man show. It's not a one man show. You have work a team, and you have to be mindful that your colleagues who assisted you, as part of the design team, a part of the implementation team, they also take the credit. Well, we we you know, I I know cases that people have said I did this, I did that, and they take all the and this is the same thing and acknowledge the work of subordinates and others. Quite often when previously when you have when roads were being opened, you know, ever so often at bridges and things like that because the highways got a lot of emphasis. At the end of the day, all the work is done by some of the junior engineering team, but at the opening when the minister comes. The chief engineer, somebody is going, you know, go down and say, yes, sir, I did this and I did this and I did that, and finally he gets the pat on the back. The poor fellows who did all the work are shoved into some corner and kept. So that is not what again you should do as a professional engineer. You all, lot of you all are still maybe at the junior level. You all are, you all may have been subjected to this. I don't know, but make sure that you don't do that to your subordinates when you come to this position. Senior position. <coughs> okay. Clause four. Again, we are talking. You know, you should only work in areas of your own specialization, right? If you are a building structural engineer, you do the. If you are a geotechnical engineer, you only you specialize in that area and you sign and take responsibility for the work done in that area. So basically, you have competence in that area. You do, and you take full responsibility for. If now a lot of us work in projects that are multidisciplinary, right? So I may be a say as a, as a mechanical engineer, I may be good in process design, but there are certain areas now. There's a lot of mechan now mechatronics has come, electrical. There's a lot of electronics. I don't know very much, so I will get a the services of a, a competent electronics or electrical engineer to guide me and help me in this and to work as a partner in designing the particular. Uh, uh, process uh, system. <coughs> Because none of us know everything, and then you are uh, yeah, now you are supposed to take responsibility. Once you sign off a drawing or a design, you are responsible. If anything goes wrong, you can be prosecuted. So you jolly well sign only what you know, and you are capable of. <coughs> Again, you don't put a signature on any documents. Or that you are not competent to do. You know. Now the ISL gives a nice seal and all that, but only use it on a, in areas where you are capable <coughs> and and you know what you are doing. So clause. Am I going too fast, or is there any questions up to up to the end of clause four? Okay. Very good. Clause five. That is again about being loyal to your employer, right? After all, he's paying you your salary, so you, it's only right that you are loyal to him, and you don't try to, you know, put him out of business. Again, here we talk again about potential conflicts of interest, right? And you should always keep your employer briefed and advised on what in any situation that is happening. Out on the in the field. If you are administering a contract, if you are the project director or or even the team leader, you then have to be impartial to in in making judgments. You are like I said earlier. True, you are representing the client. But there are situations where sometimes the, the, the claim that the contractor may have a justifiable claim by way of uh, extension of time or uh, additional 
cost variation or whatever it is. And then you have to evaluate the situation and see if it is justified, you approve it. Just because you are Mr. A's uh, representative, you just don't cut everything that other bank gives out. You have to be fair. And basically, again, you don't accept any money from now. If you, again, like a conflict of interest, now if you were to do the design for the contractor, he will offer. He's not going to. He's not expected to be free. He will give you a santosam. So you, now you are not supposed to take that. You are not supposed to do that. And and more than he's giving, sometimes people, you know, engineers have asked and fix their price, and that is not a done thing. Unless. You had discussed this with your your with your uh, boss, and if he feels that okay, in the best interest of the organization, you would be able to do the, the the design better than just getting it done outside by somebody, and he agrees to that, and then you say okay, he's going to pay me so much for doing this work. Fair enough, but it must be disclosed. It can't be hidden from your uh, from your employer or. You should not, you shall neither solicit or accept financial or other valuable considerations, including free free engineering design. Now this is something that happens uh, not so much in the but sometimes in the in like uh, uh, in the <coughs> water treatment and sewage or uh, HVAC area. The contractor might come and say, "I'll give you a good uh, design for your for the for your uh, HVAC plant and system for the for this building." And obviously, he will do a good design, but that design will be focused on using his uh, his equipment. Now, that is not a, that is a conflict of interest because you if you put that in the uh, and that goes into the uh, tender documents, nobody else can uh, can bid fairly because that whole the whole specification is virtually geared for one particular brand of of uh, of the system of systems. So you should not. Except designs being done by other, by especially by suppliers. Bribery again. We we talking of bribery over and over again. You don't. You don't ask for nor accept gratuities. We put it by cuts directly or indirectly from. Contractors or the agents or anyone dealing with the client, right, with their clients. Again, if you find that a project is not viable, you must have the courage to tell you. And if you believe it is not viable, tell your uh, boss that this is not a viable thing. But you must give him an option. Don't just say this is not viable. This will affect the environment, right? Tell him okay. If you do it like this, it will get over the problem. So you have to be able to offer a. Uh, option of how to avoid the uh, uh, harmful effects of that of that action. <coughs> Confidentiality again. You see, we are as, as the senior engineer on a project. You are you are party to all the financial documents, the costing, the preparation of the evaluation of bids, <coughs> and. Contractors will be very interested to find out what their competitors have quoted, and they might ask you, "What is the, what is so and so?" And offer you, offer obviously they won't ask for nothing. They will offer to pay you for, and but you are supposed to not tell them, because there has to be a fair pay. They can, they might ask you, "What is the engineer's estimate?" Which again, which it may be public knowledge, it may not be, but basically you have to be very careful with. Giving out information, especially financial information, to competitors and other people involved in the business. Again, this issue of not signing and see, putting your seal and all on documents that you have not personally been involved in. Okay. Anything on clause five? Anything you want to clarify or ask? <coughs> I 
clause 6, obviously be truthful. If you ask to give a statement, if you are quite often you find our engineer and if there is a made some something collapses or there is a huge flood in the area and something gets underwater or the, 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 the all the television crews will go there and start asking the engineer what happened, why didn't you open the gates and all sorts of things like that. So you must be, you must have a good idea of what you are going to tell them. Because again you are representing the organization. And if you go and do some wrong information, the press will go to town. They will say, you know, irrigation department engineer didn't know they, were, they had uh, broken down equipment, they couldn't open the gates because they were, the gates were, the mechanisms were not working and all sorts of things and the, the, the organization gets besmirched. The reputation of the organization is put in doubt. And again a question of you have to give evidence, give it honestly. If you don't give honestly also and in court you get caught, uh, you, get, you get landed for perjury. You know what perjury is? Perjury is that if you give a wrong evidence in a court of law, you can be prosecuted and locked up. Bottom line. So, and it won't be a very pleasant experience and the press will say engineer charged for perjury, uh, locked up for, remanded for and law, send us to three months RI. It's not going to be happy, a happy situation. So always be honest with what you say. If you don't know, say you don't know. Better rather than trying to. Ah, CBD. How many of you? How many of you guys, uh, girls and boys? I call you girls and boys. You are much older. Uh, follow CBD courses here at ISL. Nobody. <coughs> With ISL wasting his time. Okay, one man, two, three, four. Okay, you know the CPD continuing professional development is one of the most important things for an engineer or of any age because engineering is not a dead subject it's not a dead profession it's a live profession that's always developing it's always developing and unless you keep abreast with what's happening in the current trend you will be left behind Right. I mean, 45 odd years ago or 50 years ago, 45 years ago, okay, I'm not that old. Uh, when, when I graduated, mechanical engineer was mechanical engineer, pure simple mechanical engineering, links and belt drives and gears and that. now we are talking about mechatronics and there's a lot of electronics so coming into it, uh, road construction, all these things are different. So unless you keep abreast with the current trends in the, in the industry, you are lost. So you have to, and the only way to do that is to follow CPD by following courses. You can read now the internet is one of the best sources of information that you can get. You can get so much of information on current engineering techniques, processors, everything. So you must always try to uh, widen your knowledge and improve your knowledge by following CPD. And that is also, I think now uh, uh, it's, a, it's going to be essential part of your uh, professional review where you have to show that you have done I think 30 hours of CPD over the last so many years each year 30 hours actually when you come to a higher level once you become a chart engineer you have to show 50 hours and uh, that can be anything and also it doesn't mean only engineering because as you go up the professional ladder you get more and more into management so you can do uh, MBA you can go into HR, marketing, so law, so many other areas that you can follow uh, you know, uh, courses in to improve your knowledge and understanding of the subject. <coughs> it is lifelong learning because till you die you are learning, right? So and you should also encourage your juniors and your subordinates to also in, to get involved in lifelong learning because that is the currency of your profession. Now you may be, you, you, I suppose you are aware that ISL has got membership of the uh, uh, professional engineers 
the uh, is, uh, and uh, there are that international body of of engineers, senior engineers who are all professional engineers, say international professional engineers. Say, uh, now the only way of evaluating that every year you have to show uh, over a three-year period you have to show like 150 hours or of the 50 hours a year of CPD. It can be one, one year you can have more than 50, one year you can have less, but at the end of the three years you should have a total of, of 150. And that is the only thing that is being looked at to see that you have, you are keeping abreast with engineering, technology and method, methods that are progressively evolving. So CPD is one of the most important things for your whole career, right along you have to follow that. And here of course we <coughs> have also added in that you should help get associated with the institution, get involved with the institution. There are uh, sectional committees, there are various uh, committees in the ISL, young members, etc. that you can get involved and get involved with the ISL because that's a good way of networking as well. So you can meet other people, meet other engineers and there are so many programs that help you to develop your knowledge and understanding of the profession. Okay, clause 8. That's the last of the clauses and that was added into the uh, into the uh, clause, into the Code of Ethics 2001 and that did when environmental issues became of importance and people began to realize that the environment had to be protected and safeguarded. So we have environmental protection you must be aware of the adverse impacts of environment and take action to minimize or to completely avoid them. You should be aware of the theoretical of the legislation. There are various laws that govern environmental protection and you should be aware of those. New technology, when you are using it, you have to be aware again of what impact it has on the environment and also the safety and of people using it. Material, waste material, ideally you should try to, if you can recover what you can and bring in a safe disposal or reuse of, of, of waste a material. These are common day things and finally conservation again this is something that I think everybody is aware of. We always talk of energy conservation, minimize the use of lights, use solar, use wind energy whatever it is. Try to use the natural resources and minimize the, the use of uh, you know, fossil fuels or whatever artificially created uh, energy sources that are uh, cost, big cost to the country and more than that do environmental damage to the, uh, to the, to the world. So anything on these eight clauses that you want to ask? Any questions, anything you want to, that is not clear? So just to sum up, you see the ISL code of ethics deals, the clause 1 deals with people, the primary concern <coughs> is people, the public, clause 2 is that you uphold the profession, you don't let down the profession by doing wrong things, you develop your reputation through your own achievements, right? and not by undercutting and you know resorting to connections and various things like that. You practice only in areas of your specialization. You are loyal to your employee, you are truthful in reporting, you are involved in lifelong learning. 
and ensure that you practice environmental sustainability. So these are the eight clauses. I think you need to know these and to, I just made a little acronym PPA that is like for the first three pass past pupils association and uh, SLT, Sri Lanka Transport and Logistic Engineer. So whatever it is, it's just a way of trying to remember these things but I think you need to know what each of the clauses is about <coughs> and uh, maybe frame this in your room and keep it so that you will be practicing. You can't have those long clauses but this is one way of giving you an idea of being aware of what's happening. This is a little cartoon that I found in the web. Uh, you are, I don't know whether you are familiar with Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin is a small boy and he has a pet tiger. Uh, he has a toy tiger, stuffed toy tiger, but he makes believe that the tiger is a real, like a companion and he and the tiger go on all sorts of jobs. So he says, I don't believe in ethics anymore. As far as I am concerned, the ends justify the means. That, that is what a lot of people do. We do the wrong thing because we feel that's that's okay for me, right? You get what you can while the going is good. Might makes right. That is the strong people only benefit and do the right. The winners write the history books. It's a dog eat dog world and all of that. He's he's basically saying that ethics is not I mean if I am concerned, I don't bother about ethics. And uh, then they are walking and suddenly hopes, use him a push. And he says, why did you do that? So it, the little tiger says, you are in my way and now you are not. So the end justifies the means. So he pushes him out because he was blocking his path and he pushed, pushed his shoulder into the mud, mud hole. So now he says, I, I didn't mean that applies to everyone. It, the, all what he said applies only to him, where he can avoid all the the rules and regulations. Anyhow, professional conduct, there is nothing much here, I will avoid this. And we will get on to disciplinary procedures. Now, disciplinary procedures are very important. Uh, because uh, when you violate the code of ethics in some form or another, <coughs> you can be, and if you are found out, the IESL can take action against you. And remember that when you, you know, name the circulator at the uh, once you pass the PR and all that, the names are circulated to all corporate members for a period of one month. And if anyone has anything to say against your behavior in the past, they can send in a petition. Say that you are not fit to be a chartered entity. I don't think people know this, but I think it's good for you to know that because it's there in the PR rules right somewhere. But basically, you are put on trial. You are named or circulated to all the corporate members. And anyone who thinks that you have done something wrong can write to the institution. And you will be surprised at the number of letters we get when the, after the list goes out saying that various engineers did their own thing. And when I was secretary here, one case that uh, was there, the, we got a letter from an uh, academic saying uh, this person, you know, paid out the money. So, when we called the person and, and he goes, he had the, how he had done it. So, he called the person for inquiry. Then you have to go to the whole of the process in there. You go to the process and call the person for inquiry, you send him and he has to respond in writing and then we <coughs> there's a panel appointed of senior members to look into this and and this person said look I never did anything wrong, I, I was perfectly, he got an yes I work for this person 
uh, just talk to finish my uh, degree or trailer the stock that I was working for him on a project that he was doing, but I never played out any money. So what, you were, what had happened was that this guy had been, uh, this, uh, they had to take reading in various levels, the water level in different tanks in a particular area. And this uh, academic had told this guy, you go and monitor, every week go and monitor the results. And, and the farmers there had been given the job of taking the reading with twice a day or whatever it is. And collect all the reading and you pay this farmer uh, 250 rupees for, for that uh, week's work of 500 rupees or So this guy happily went and took the money and went and he got the result and he said, ah yes, yes, the boss has said to pay you 300 rupees, so he gave him 300, pocketed 200 rupees and that's okay. And so this went on and the project finished and then this guy got I mean, after finishing the instruction, he left the and went off. And then one day when the this academic went there to the field, the farmer said, sir, and then he has said, you know, the post conversation, he said, they want to get fancy. Then I said, then he started digging up, he found that this guy had been regularly playing on this 200 for about 20 or two hours. And, uh, and he had, then he got letters there. You know, these are the farmers gave a written. This guy was also the academic, but he did fix this guy. <laughs> you know, and we got letters from him saying that this is what happened, that he only got so much. Uh, and uh, then he used to get them to sign receipts of what he had. <coughs> Both of them, they didn't know, so they have to have to decide. They got something to do. They were. And then uh, when the when we, uh, panel questioned him, Finally, he admitted that he had done this and he wanted to buy a bike because by the time he had got married and the wife was somewhere, he had bought a bike to travel from his workplace. So, what do you do with a case like that? Now, I mean, the most serious thing is that that's, that's fraud and uh, you can fire him and take him off the road, but then you are jeopardizing the career of a young engineer. We felt that that is not the best thing to do. So we warned him and said, okay, we suspend your award of the charter for two years. Well, by that time, he had passed the PE paper and the whole works. And for two years, uh, we have to do some senior people in government service. You know, but that's the, that's the least. Otherwise, technically, you should be fired. You should be taken off the road of the ISL. The fraud is a big crime. So we are fortunate that the panel of Senior engineers who evaluated his case were considerate for him and didn't want to <coughs> upset his future too much. Otherwise, he would have been taken off the road. So, so he, we had to be very careful because your your past sins can come back to you if you are if you are uh, uh, somebody writes or what any, any wrong you have done in the when you were working sometime earlier. So you have to be very careful that you don't allow people to use the disciplinary procedure that are in place to fix you. Okay. So what it says that any member against whom an allegation of misconduct has been made in writing so you can't just come and tell the executive secretary, I have gone to make this complaint. You have to send a formal written complaint. Right. And the president of the IASN will write to the person against whom the allegation is made, saying that this has been said about you and give him a chance to vindicate himself, that is to, to disprove what has been said. And then hopefully this guy writes back and giving his reasons. He's given a time frame, maybe two weeks or uh, four weeks or days to respond. And then the president will, in, consult in consultation with the president-elect, decide whether he has vindicated himself or not. If he is unable, if he has vindicated himself and his 
explanation is ex acceptable, then uh, matter closer than the end of the story. But if he is unable to justify and to prove that he has not done any wrong, then the case is referred to a disciplinary committee who will investigate and report to the council. Now, the, the disciplinary committee is formed at the first council meeting. Now, the first council meeting is held on the day of the AGM. After the AGM, the council, the new council meets and the council at that meeting will also decide pick the disciplinary committee. <coughs> and they will nominate six fellows to constitute, to be uh, in the pool. Now of those six fellows, any three can be nominated to become, a, a panel, to form the panel. And that those three will be nominated, let's say if there is a complaint received, then when it goes to the council meeting, the council will not say, okay, of these six people, these three people can form the inquiry panel. So they, the council will also prepare the terms of reference for the disciplinary committee and they will nominate a chairperson who will generally be the most senior, generally the past president and two other fellows or two past presidents and a fellow, so any of the most senior past president is, the, is made the chairman or the chairperson. <coughs> then the executive committee will again write to this guy, to the person against whom the allegation has been made and say that these are the charges that have been formulated against you, that are brought against you the names of the disciplinary committee and he has to respond in writing within 14 days of any, if he has anything to say and he is also getting given a date to appear. Now, why do you think they send the names of the disciplinary committee to the person? Why should they send the names of the disciplinary committee to the person? If you go to court and the, uh, the magistrate is there or the, the, uh, the bench, the judges are there, you can't say, you can't say anything, you have to accept what is there. But the ISL gives you a fair chance because you may feel that one of the, those members have a, a prejudice against you. That there, there is something that for some reason he doesn't like you. You may have worked under him at some point that you may not have been his pet or you may have been, you know, got involved with the daughter and this or something and again he is angry with you. So there may be some reason why he is, why you feel that particular member of the disciplinary panel can be prejudiced against you know, fair decision in your favour. So then you have the option of writing back and telling the council, I, I object to Mr. A, a being in this panel for the following reasons. And, and those objections and, he, and, Mr. and the objections for having a particular person in the disciplinary panel can, will be evaluated by the president and the president and a vice president and if they feel that what he has said is justified they will reconstitute the panel so that person will be removed and somebody else will be put in place and that will again be circulated now if you object again well you can you know well, you have to again change the panel so in, but ideally, I mean, so far we had maybe one person might object because all three members can't be against him, hopefully. And then, so he'll object to one, against one person maybe, and and then the panel is in place. Now the, at the then now we then we come to the actual inquiry, and at this inquiry, the the person against whom the accusation is made can either make his own defend himself in a way. 
or he can get a senior like corporate member to represent him or to, to be his attorney in a sense. We don't allow real lawyers to come in here, but now we have a few engineers who are lawyers who have become a, a, attorneys at law, but uh, they are mostly in the arbitration, so they won't come and get involved in this. So, but, but basically, we get some senior member can represent him if he wants. Quite often, they prefer to defend themselves because they know the story and they are going to explain the whole thing to another person. Eh? And then the disciplinary committee will listen to all the, the arguments given on both sides and take a decision and the idea, ideal situation that you try to complete the uh, inquiry within one month. So we don't want this to drag on and on like court cases. You know, court cases go on for years and years and years. That's why one reason we don't want lawyers coming in there because that everything will drag on. So we try to finish it off in one month, maybe one and a half months at the Worst in the worst case scenario, but definitely nothing more than one and a half or two months. If he, if the person doesn't come for the hearing, which is very clear, his advantage, because disadvantage, because he doesn't know what can do, he will be given one warning and another day fixed. But if he doesn't come the second time, then the session, the proceeding will be held ex parte, ex parte in his absence. So, it is always good for him to be there to be present when this is going on. Otherwise, he doesn't know what will be, it can be totally biased against both of us. So he should come. So on the evidence that we provided the documentary evidence and the verbal uh, exam, uh, evidence given at the uh, inquiry, the, the committee will consider will decide, no, based on the documentary evidence that they have initially, they can, they can decide that they won't conduct inquiry, but generally it never happens. Always they, it is better, yeah, it is better to have an inquiry and to let that person come and give his point of view. Because otherwise, again, it tends to be you know, a bit one-sided. Yeah, the disciplinary committee, the committee will proceed with this and if they feel at any one point it is necessary to get the legal opinion because if it is a serious thing that, we, that involves the removal of an engineer from the role of the institution and you know, nowadays you can consider to be violating the fundamental rights and you know, human rights and all these things like that. So they can go and get ask for legal opinion in certain matters. For which, technically, they say the guy who, the person who will be accused has to pay, but generally we have never done that. I, if ever we do it, the ISL has borne that cost. <coughs> so the, the disciplinary committee decision is final. But that does not mean. that the person cannot appeal. He can no. so once they submit the their findings, the the the, the findings are put up to the ethnics council meeting. And at that point the council can decide on whether whether the the punishment on the degree of the punishment to be given to the person. He can, he can go from a warning, a written warning, right up to removal from the role. Now, if you are going to remove a person from the role, or be to, a person can be expelled from the role, then you must have a majority of the council, the full council almost must be there. At least two thirds of the council must be present. And the decision is taken. But generally, so far, we have never had a situation where people have they come to a point where we have had to remove a person, or there has been a very serious breach in India. Always, the institutions try to be, well, I won't say sympathetic, but to be a fair, because especially a young engineer, we don't like to, you know, buckle his career for the rest of his life. We don't want to 
no, no, mere obstacle. Better to correct, to advise him, correct, give him a small uh, say, uh, punishment like what we did in the way that we suspended the guy or held back the charter for two years and then uh, allow him to proceed with his, with his career. So the executive secretary informed him, then the member can appeal within one month of uh, of in uh, of uh, date of receipt of such or that is the executive secretary will write and say this is the decision taken by the council and he can appeal. Now the council they they refer that appeal back to the disciplinary committee for their observations, uh, which frankly I don't think is a is, is good because. That this that disciplinary committee has already made up their mind. They have already found this person uh, guilty of whatever it is, and they have fixed the punishment. And uh, but they know, hopefully, that they are also impartial and they act honestly. They it goes back to them, and and they can decide to either uh, minimize the the uh, punishment or uh, say that no, oh, this punishment stands. And that is again conveyed back to the council and the council and the executive secretary will write back to that person. So there is a procedure. Generally, fortunately, I think the ISL has not had to enforce it too often. I don't think they're not I mean, I think I would think very rarely that we had to go. But uh, basically it is there and it's not something like a legal process or a the court of law where there are, you know, uh, like punishments that could be uh, result in a much more serious measure. Here, the worst would be suspension from the institution, and that, of course, is something that uh, now people can be taken off the role of the institution also for not paying their fees, but then that is not considered a criminal offense. I mean, if you don't pay your role, there are a lot of people who, after some time, he said, okay, what's the point of continuing as a member? They stop paying. Or if they go abroad, rather than when they go abroad, they don't continue to pay the Sri Lankan uh, ISL membership. So those things happen, but those are not, that is not considered like a, uh, some fraud or some criminal action that requires punishment. So basically, that, that's the end of the uh, disciplinary procedures. And Ethics really tells you either you do the right thing or you or you or you or you're doing the wrong thing. But I think what happens is a lot of people take the middle path and say, okay, it depends. In this situation we will do this, in this situation we won't do that. So they think it depends on how the situation is and you but that is really not the correct way to look at it. It's right or wrong, there's no halfway house in between. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, if there are any questions. I'll be happy to try to answer. If you want to, in the course, as you are progress with your style, your preparation for the e paper, if you want to answer, if you answer the uh, past paper, I you we will be answering the past paper, or you try to answer the past paper. And uh, if you need any help <coughs> or clarification from me, you are always free to contact me. Then I'll give the secretariat to give you my contact details, and you can always. Uh, speak to me at the phone or send an email with your with what you've done, and I'll be happy to collect those and send them back to you. Okay, so yeah, good luck with the exam. I think the exam might be somewhere on March next year, or, and I hope all of you pass. And I don't see you here again next year, or at the next one in June or whenever it is July or whenever we have the next big paper presentation. And I'm sure that all of you will be good. Ethical engineers uh, in the future. Okay, so thanks a lot and good night. <laughs>